And I'm going to say welcome, everyone, to our workshop, the critique of our paid participant images. Uh, I hope you're all healthy, happy, content. And uh, today's meeting is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have Mike uh, go ahead and critique the images of the participants that paid for last week's workshop. They're going to be viewed and uh, critiqued by Mike today. Mike has been on with me actually quite early. So I'm going to stop my share here. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Hang on, Mike. Already. OK, you should be able to go in now. All right. Tom, you see my sc the screen there with the picture? Yep, yep. All righty, well, um, I always like to start off when I do critiques is to let people know that, uh, that when I critique your image, it's just my opinion. Doesn't mean I'm right, doesn't mean I'm wrong. It's just an opinion. My opinion is based on experience of success through the years, and so, I look at an image and I look at it and say, well, if this was my image, this is what I would have done to it, okay? So um, you can take my advice or you can say, well, I don't agree with it. Um, I actually uh, used to, uh, for many years, I used to judge contests, you know, people would ask, clubs would ask and uh, be at conferences and they ask, would you mind being a judge for our contest? And I would do it, but, um, I never liked judging contests because um, I've had issues with some of the online contests that I did where I would pick a winner and you'd have people grumbling about the choice I made, <laughs> you know? And so I don't do any judging anymore because um, it seems like no matter what you say or do, someone's gonna disagree and that's okay. Um, but uh, so I'm gonna critique these images. And again, I'm just gonna tell you my opinion on how I would do it if it was my image. And most of them were actually pretty good images, but a lot of them just needed some tweaking on the, the cropping um, and a few, few minor things here and there, but they were all pretty nice. So the program I'm in right now is a program called Smart Photo Editor. And this is my main program that I use. And it's an amazing program. Uh, there is uh, somewhere between 7,000 and 8,000 creative filters that you can, uh, you can apply to your image. And so that's really cool how you can uh, make all kinds of cool adjustments in your images and, and apply, you know, textures and things like that. Um, what's really nice about this program is it, uh, it only runs like $29. So it's, it's not an expensive program to get into. Uh, if you go to uh, their, their website, like I say, just go to uh, smartphotoeditor.com and, um, and you'll be able to see the program. They actually have a free trial that you can download and you can play with it, but uh, you'll kind of see a little bit uh, of the program that uh, I'm going to show you here. All right, so this is the first image and let me just open up and see. This was Joy's, Joy Johnson. All right, so I like the uh, subject matter. Um, I like the flower and I like the little buds and, and, and the stems and, and I, I like the composition. Uh, and I do uh, occasionally do vignettes, white vignettes and dark vignettes. Uh, but the problem with the vignette that they've applied here is that uh, your subject is so close to the edge here that the, the vignette is now um, washed out your colors. And so you've got nice color range in the center here, but your vignette is covering up some of your buds here and washing out the colors and you don't wanna do that. So whenever you have an image where the uh, subject is very close to the edges, it's probably not a good choice to do a vignette on that. You'd rather have that, that subject more in the center and then the vignette just kind of darkens or lightens around the outside edges. So um, that would be my critique as far as this one. Now, uh, this one, I wouldn't recommend a vignette on because like I said, it's, it's just too close to the edge. Now, the other thing is, and, and I noticed this on pretty much most of the images is just the style that I crop my images in. Uh, I'm gonna just kind of apply that to a lot of these images. So 
you have uh, a little gap down here from the edge of the uh, of the um, the bud here to the edge of the frame. And what I usually try to do is I try to balance that all the way around the frame. So if you have this much gap down here, then I would probably do the exact same amount of gap up here. So if I crop this, I would end up bringing this down so that I would have about the same amount of gap from here to here as you'd have from here to here. So I always balance my gaps. And so I would crop this like that. Um, and I would probably even crop a little tighter. Uh, most of my images, which I'm going to show you some other stuff later in, in the program after I do the critiques, and you'll see most of my images are cropped pretty tight. So I would probably even crop a little more off down here and a little bit more up here. Um, but uh, so the image itself, like I say, is a, the subject matter is pretty good. And I think even the composition in the frame is pretty good. It's just I think the vignette has kind of washed out the color so you don't get the rich colors of the subject. The other thing I noticed too is a lot of the images, I like to do sharpening, more sharpening on my images. So, and this is, uh, you'll see here the uh, filters. These are different filters that you can apply. And if you go through here and click on them, you'll see all different types of filters. So uh, if you look up here, it says pages. So this is number two of 655 pages. And as you can see, there's 12 images per page and you can kind of go through and it gives you all types of different things. Um, so I like to go into over on the left side here and you'll see these are all the different things you can go into uh, and, and I like to go in and do sharpening on all my images. And so if we pull up the sharpening on this image now, um, watch the image and watch right in this area right in here. I'm going to go back to the original and there's the original image right there and then watch me go to the sharpening version. Whoops. And you can see how it gets sharper. Just on this, all the details in here start to pop up. And because the subject's kind of small, you won't notice it as much in this one. But when we show you some of the other images, you'll notice it a little bit more. Um, so again, I would crop. crop. I wouldn't put a vignette on this one because like I say, you're washing out your subjects. And there is some nice color in here. But like I say, that white vignette just kind of washed it out. So. And we have a second image by Joy. Why did that do that? There we go. Okay, so this one here, I um, I like there's some contrast, nice contrast. You've got the dark rust and the colors and stuff, and then the lighter colors of the stones and rocks over here. So you got a lot of contrast there, a lot of textures in there. You know, the old ra uh, the, the rail here has got a lot of nice texture in it, a lot of textures all around here and in the wood and everything. Uh, and I like the angle. She's got a nice angle here rather than you'll see people that'll take a straight line and run it vertical or horizontal. And you don't want to ever do that. You always want to put angles on your lines. All right, so this one here, you can see when you look in close, it's not very sharp. Uh, there's not a lot of sharpness in the image. And I don't know if uh, she just sent the image out of the camera or if she applied sharpening. And you can see it's sharper on this side than it is on this side. So basically she's used a probably a smaller f-stop number and she didn't get enough depth of field to reach over into this section here and pull any of the details. And when you have a lot of nice textures and, and things like this that are going on in the rocks, you kind of want that to be sharp so that you get to see all that nice texture rather than blur it out or soften it out. Um, so a, just a higher f-stop would have got more details over on this right side, but we can add more sharpening in here. Again, just go to the sharpening. Let's pull it back up. <clears throat> now, if you look into this area right in here, watch this area here and I'll show you the, the difference here. Now there, there's the original. Look how much sharper it is now. Look at in the rail, the top of this rail right here. You can see all the texture and the details pop out when you add that sharpening in there. And that's what I was talking about last week when I was saying that, you know, yeah, you can shoot in high f-stops and get a little softness, 
but that's not going to be a problem because with these sharpening tools, it'll bring that sharpness out of that subject, even though it might be a little soft to begin with. The same with up in the, all in this area here. <clears throat> you look at the original and look, it's kind of blurry. And now you can see a lot more details there. Um, so always, you know, do some sharpening on your images. You know, uh, it's, it's really important to do that if you want nice, sharp looking images. And as you can see, it's not, you know, people always talk about when you add too much sharpening, it gets kind of weird looking, but th that isn't the case here. It's, it's just improved the image in terms of going from that softness that you're seeing there to nice and sharp like you see there. Uh, other than that, I think subject looks good. Uh, I wouldn't critique too much on the on this one here. I think the uh, uh, the cropping and everything came out fine. All right, so now we got Tom. Okay, so <clears throat> Tom has got a lot of white area in here that's kind of washed out. If you remember last week, I was talking about a diffuser and the diffuser is gonna eliminate all that washed out area here. So it's just the light, it's a shiny subject. So it's just light hitting at a certain angle that's washed out the nice colors you have there. Um, so that would be uh, my suggestion is get yourself that diffuser and make sure you diffuse over that when you're seeing all that washed out area because you lost your colors there. You got nice colors all throughout everything else, but then you've lost your colors up here. Um, now, this is something that on Tom's next image, I know, uh, you know, I'm going to critique and, and see, so, see how he's cut into the leaf here. And that's OK. Um, and that's all right to do that. Uh, I'm going to show you some images later where I cut off quite a bit of subjects like that. Um, now, in this one here, the only thing I would do is, again, on the cropping, um, you see the gap you have here and the gap you have down here. Those are pretty equal as far as the, the, the distance from the edge of the frame to the subject. I would also do that over here. So I always like to, again, balance my all my gaps so that they are equal all the way around. So now I've got this pretty much the same amount of gap here as I have over here as I have over down here. And that's kind of how I always set up my my um, my cropping on my images. I try to keep all those the same all the way around. Uh, sharpness on this one looks pretty good, but you know, let's just add sharpening and see what happens. Okay, let's let's see, that's the original. And then there's with some sharpening. So there's the original. Now watching the leaves, how all the details pop out. You see so much more details popping out on the leaves. So that would be what I would do. I would have cropped it just a little tighter uh, and then added this extra sharpening. And then you've got a nice angle on the, on the subject matter and that's good. So that worked out. And I do like this textured background. Uh, for a lot of images, Sometimes just a solid color, you know, background looks good, but then sometimes it's nice when you can add a little bit of texture in the background, kind of fills in those areas. And then his lighting, you know, you can see he's got lighting come down. That's why it's kind of washed out here. But you can see how the lighting is kind of affected here too. So you got a little bit of light and then it goes to a little bit of darkness around there, which is nice. And then Tom's next image, and this is uh, this is something um, that I see a lot on images, a lot of times. And I think there's some more in here that have this same issue. Uh, but you've got your tip, the very tip of the leaf touching the edge of the frame. Uh, same over here, you got the very tip touching the edge of the frame. And what you wanna do is you wanna have a little bit of gap there kind of like what you did on the last image where you had a gap around it. Um, it's okay, like I said on the last image where you cut into the leaf, it's all right if you cut into the leaf, but cut in enough to show you wanted it out of the frame and you just don't wanna be touching the edge of the frame. You wanna have a little bit of gap there. It doesn't have to be a huge gap, but a little bit. Now an image like this, uh, because these leaves are going so wide on the subject matter, uh, this is the most interesting part of the subject right here. And so you've got a huge gap of nothing here and a gap of nothing here trying to get those leaves in there. So what I usually do on something like that, and you'll see again, I've got a perfect example of this in my program later in, in, today, uh, where I cut into leaves, just like you cut 
or what I'm going to do on this one here, where I would cut this in like that. So cut off those leaves and maybe even take a little bit up here. Because the most interesting part of this subject is right in here. So you've eliminated all this space around here, which now means that your main part of your image right here is larger in the frame and we can see it better. And so um, it's okay, like I say, to cut into leaves and cut leaves off. You just don't want, if you're gonna include the leaf, make sure you leave a gap on the end and don't leave that tip touching the edge of the frame. All right, let's go in again, throw a little sharpening on there and now, a lot of times, if it looks like it's too sharp, you can always just take this slider here, see up on the left there, that master fade, and just back off. If I take it all the way off, that's the original with no sharpening. And then you can add a little bit more and a little bit more until you get where it looks good. Click OK. All right. But I like the background. I think the background, it looks really good with the different you know, colors. And it contrasts really well when you get purple and yellow, those work really good together. So it has a really nice contrast to it. So interesting subject, cool subject. Oops, keep clicking too much on it. All right, you know what I'm gonna do with this one though? All right, I'm gonna shut this down because I'm gonna go into Photoshop because the next image, I wanna show you something interesting. All right, so when I look at this image here, I see these cool little guys right here. It's kind of the fungus growing off this dead tree, okay? And so I think that's pretty cool. But what I don't like is the tree trunk here. You see it's got all this little white hey, spots Mike, all over. Yeah. For some reason, I'm not, uh, I don't know if everybody else has got the same thing, but I'm looking at your screen and I'm not, I'm seeing tutorials. I'm not seeing, I see load my image, but I don't see the image. Hmm. I see it. Did you click on it? Yeah, I'm looking at it on my screen here. I'm in Photoshop. Oh. Let me see something. I, I, I don't see it either. You don't? Oh, okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Oh. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, yeah. I see other people chiming in. Same thing. Uh, we're seeing right. tutorials, but we're not. Uh, and I'm seeing it. I'm sharing the screen with you. You're. I'm looking at your screen, but I'm not seeing what you're talking about. And I think others are seeing the same thing. Are you seeing this screen? Yeah, I'm seeing a screen called tutorials. Yeah, that's the. Um... And you're. Oh, you know on... what? I'm gonna try to get in here. Maybe, maybe I need to share that other screen. Let me see here. Do you see just a, a blue, like blue, all blue? No, no, no. No, we're seeing a screen and you're moving it every once in a while, you move it around, but uh, you don't have the screen up that. Uh, okay, how's that? That yeah. Now we got it. Okay, I had, to, uh, I had to change the uh, screen sharing to get to this oh, one. Okay, okay, I'm gonna mute me. And I just assume the... that wherever I went, it would just come up, but it looks like I have to change the, sh the screen share every time. All right, so there's a, a, you know, what I usually do is if I have an image like this and there's like little white spots, and I talked about this in my program last week, uh, you know, about cleaning up the subject and making it look better, okay? Um, I'll usually go in and I'll, I'll, I'll hit my, uh, spot healing brush and I'll just kind of go through and, and click on things and try to get rid of as many of those little specks as I can. 
but there's so much of it, you know, it would take a long time to clean it all up. And I mean, you could do it, but it would just be time consuming and wouldn't be that uh, fun to have to do. So there is a filter in Topaz. And this Topaz, uh, is, this is the collection of the Topaz programs. And there's one called Simplify 4. And there's a, a filter here called Buzz Zim. And when you click on Buzz Zim, it seems to eliminate all those little white specks. I don't know how it does it, but, and I've recommended this filter to other people that have the same issue with a lot of white specks and stuff like that. And it seems to do really well. Now it does kind of give the log kind of a painted effect like you can see, um, but I kind of like that. I think it just adds a little bit more of an artistic look to it. So if we- Hey Mike, up, hate to chime in again, but- yeah. Uh, it didn't do anything. Oh Your my filter God. Didn't. You're kidding. If you, it's got a little blue circle and it did not uh, do the rendering or whatever. I guess every time I change programs, I have to that, change. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it must be every time I change programs, I have to change the uh, screen share. All right. Well, yeah, I'm not going to do it that often, but I wanted to, uh, on okay. this one in particular, I'll was uh, one I wanted to show this Buzz Zim thing. So if, if I go to the, there's the original image. See all the little white specks and everything? You can see that, Tom? Tom? Are you seeing all yes, the little white specks? I'm back on. I muted okay. myself. Yeah. Okay. All right. So when I click on this Buzz Zim filter, like I said, you can see how it takes oh, all yeah. that out. It blurred it a lot of kind of, it. Oh yeah, it took all the white out. It, it kind of leaves it as kind of a um, painted look on the wood, but it didn't affect too much on the other parts here. So I use that occasionally when I have a, a, a situation where I have a lot of little white specks and I want to eliminate them. It just I don't know how it does it, but it seems to eliminate them. So we hit apply and then I'll probably have to change screens again. Yeah, somebody, somebody mentioned here that they actually apply, uh, they like the uh, original better. Uh, well, as I said, as, as I said, that's just an opinion. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. And, yeah, and I always uh, like, uh, like you started off the critique today stating it's an opinion yeah, and you could have five opinions that would all differ. So exactly I right. All right, so I'm I'm not going to be able to do these screen sherry things because it's just too complicated. All right, let me. There. Okay, we got you. Uh, you're not sharing right now. Right. There okay. we go. We're good. All right, so I'm going to save this image here and then I can pull it back up in uh, Smart Photo Editor. I'll just go into Smart Photo Editor and stay there because it's obviously I, I can't yeah. Um, so I can't switch screens without having to change the whole screen configuration in the program, unfortunately. One way I do it is I have another monitor and if oh, you have another right? monitor, it's easy to do. All right, so let's go back into our original, which is the. Uh... Pull up smart photo editor. All right, you seeing seeing the tutorial one again? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, so I'm gonna pull that image back in. Let's see if we have the sh saved one here. Okay, all right, so let's see. All right, so I'm gonna, uh, again, go in and add that uh, sharpening like I did on the other ones. But I'm not going to shrink that down a little bit. 
and we're going to back it off. Just want a little bit of sharpening. All right. All right. Now on an image like this, I see actually two different crops out of this image. The most interesting part to me are these little guys right here, right? And maybe this guy. So again, cropping wise, I failed to save that. That's why it screwed up. Save it. Okay. All right. Now, as I mentioned about a crop, because this is the most interesting part, these four little guys and this guy here, you don't really need that much of the wood. So you can bring this in like that. Now you make these larger in the frame. And again, that's the most interesting part. The other um, crop you could do would have been to just do these four right here. And now they even get larger in the frame. Because you have to look at what's the most interesting part of the, you know, the, the whole subject you're photographing. And these guys here are the most interesting part. So why not make those larger in the frame? Why have them so small and include so much of the outside area around it? Um, this tree trunk is good. It's going on a nice angle like you see here. Uh, and I like these little guys here. These are cool. And even this is okay down in here. So you've got two different crops you can do there. Uh, Yeah, like I was saying, you know, all those little white specks in there, it would be the same as what I mentioned in my program That's last week. Um, you know, you would never put a model's face on the front of a cover with all kinds of blemishes and imperfection in their face. Now, you could say that's natural, but that's not why they, they, they don't do it that way, because there's no model or no actress would want their face shown with all the imperfections. So when I look at images, I think, I don't want to see those imperfections in there. They're, they're, they kind of pull your eye away from all what's more interesting. Okay, so now we have, oh, that was Barbara's, that last one. What was that name on this one here? Uh, Edward McEwen. Now, some people uh, entered uh, three images uh, and we originally said one or two. So those who had entered three, I just eliminated uh, one of their images, because if somebody has three, then everybody else is going to say, how come I didn't get three? <laughs> so, all right. Now, Edward looks like he put a vignette around the outside. But if you notice, his vignette is not causing any issues with the main part of the subject right here. So that's okay. Now, you see he's got a gap over here, and that's good. Remember what he said? We don't want the main subject touching the edge of the frame, but over here, he's got the main subject touching the edge of the frame. So he needs to have a gap over on this side equal to at least the gap over on this side. Uh, but uh, he's cut off part of his thing here. Uh, and again, this would be okay if you were to bring this side in of the frame to kind of equal what he did over on that side. So we bring this in and did something like that. So now, at least as it balances, he's cut off some here and cut off some over here. But if you're going to have a gap on one side, you should have a gap on the other side. But uh, nice details. This one looks pretty sharp. You know, you don't really need to add any sharpening to it. It looks pretty sharp. Uh, and again, I like he put this dark vignette kind of thing around here down at the bottom. And that looks like, and it looks pretty cool. So this one come out nice. Uh, cool subject. It's got, uh, again, a lot of interesting designs and nice textures in the wood. It's always good having old rotted wood like that where it's kind of falling apart and uh, getting kind of decayed looking. So that's pretty cool. And then the next image is also Edward McEwen. Now he submitted two images of this subject here. And the first one, he showed a much larger area of this. 
And the first thing I thought of is he should have cropped in tighter and emphasized this guy right here because that was the most interesting of, of all the plants. You can see there's, it's just kind of textury and, and there's really no lines or designs, but this, this is, has some really cool lines and, and interesting design going on it. So that is the one you want uh, to key in on. And so that's what he did. Uh, again, he sent me, the original one he sent was a larger where you saw more of this subject, a lot more of it. And that was the first thing I thought is he really needed to move in and capture this area right here and make that kind of the main subject in the frame. And then you just have all the nice textures and stuff around it. And then he's got this kind of a lighter color in the background, different tones. And so it contrasts really well and makes the main subject here stand out against the background. Um, now, whether he could have blurred it out a little bit more in the background, uh, maybe, um, depending on the f-stop. You can always go into um, program, uh, which again, I wish I could take you in there, but it's going to mess up the screen, uh, called Smart Photo Editor. Uh, I'm sorry, um, it's Nick Software's Viveza, and you can kind of drop a control point up in here, and then you can actually just blur this out some more in the background if you wanted to blur it more. But it's not bad. It's, it's decently blurred out. All right, so this one here um, is another one cropping wise. I would do some more cropping on it. Um, and it's soft, you can see it's kind of blurry. And again, we'll just go and add some sharpening in there and you'll see it'll make a big difference. All right, so let's, here's the original. That's the original and that's with the sharpening added. All right, so it, it did sharpen it up quite a bit. Now, where's the main, what's the most interesting part of this flower? Well, it's kind of this area right in here. And you've got random leaves, you've got a stem back in here, just kind of floating around out here. And so I don't really see anything that's that interesting in this, you know, this here. So again, crop it in. And this is something that you would typically do uh, in your, whoops you would typically do in your, when you're shooting the subject, try to get that crop when you shoot it, if you can. But if not, then uh, you always you gotta remember to click okay so that it locks that in. Remember what I said about edges? You see, so I wanna bring this in, but I don't want the edge touching the frame. So I wouldn't bring it in here and, and, and touch that edge of that frame like that. I would just bring it right there. And she's touched the tip down here, see? Nothing I can do about that. I mean, you could add some canvas on there to, to fill it in, but when you shoot it, you gotta make sure you check that stuff out. So you don't want that touching. So we wouldn't want that to be touching there. Now, another thing is, let's say we're bringing this side in. Do we want to leave this little gap in there? Because sometimes that stuff will pull your eye. So you could actually bring it in so that you eliminate the gap or leave it in and just take some of this and clone into that area so that you get rid of that little gap because those little colors, that little color, straight color will pull your eye. But you could make this image into a square crop kind of. So it'd be something like that. Now you get to see the main part here really large in the frame and you don't have all that other stuff that's not all that interesting in there. Um, here's those little white specks again, but they're not bad enough that you could just use the healing brush in Photoshop and just click on those and get rid of them. And you'd be, you'd be surprised the difference in the quality of an image when you get rid of all those little specks and you make it nice and, and pristine looking. And that image that we just showed was Mike Heller. And this is another one of Mike's. Okay, so again, soft looking, not real sharp. I'm gonna just pull in some more sharpness. All 
All right. There's the original. This is the original. So take a look at it as I add the sharpening. There's the sharpening. You see how much difference it makes? It looks soft and out of focus, and now it's sharp. Same with this one here. Cropping wise, you don't need all this big gap over here because here's the main subject. So as I said, most of the images for me is the cropping. Remember what I said, I wanna to try to keep the gap here the same over here. So whatever I gap it on one side, I'll try to keep that same gap. There, now we eliminated all that space out here. You just got vacant space. It's not, help, it's not helping make your image any better. So why have it there? Uh, and again, once you crop it in, now this main part, which is the most interesting part, becomes larger in the frame. So we can see all the details better. Now you've got washed out colors here. And again, it's exactly what I talked about in my program last week. If you needed a diffuser, put a diffuser over that, you wouldn't have that washed out color. No color there. So it'd be hard to bring that back to the purple color. And those are just minor things, but it, it's what makes a big difference in your images, you know. Again, it's all that, you know, it's just like the little white specks. It's just simple little things like that then that make a big difference. All right, so this is John Furlong. Oh, that's cool. So this guy's pretty cool looking. Um, We add a little sharpness in there. And we're gonna back it off some because it's not not take it all the way. There's the there's the original there. We add a little bit, look at all the pop. You get that pop in the details. Hey Mike. Yeah. Uh when you're evaluating and critiquing each image, would it be okay if the individual unmutes himself just sure. to make a comment if they want to? Sure. I just want everybody to know that. Uh, when when uh, Mike is going through your images, just for the during the time that uh, he's critiquing your image, feel free to click the uh, mic button and make any comments. Yeah, if there's some reason why you did something, whatever you did, so we know that. Because a lot of times, uh, you know, I've had images where I uh, crop down areas and people said, well, you know, what was in that area? Well, there was a, a, a mass of clutter there that was not interesting. So that's why it got cropped out. Um, so sometimes there's reason why people crop when they do. But most of you have, have actually had more than you probably needed around your subject matter. And that is the number one issue when people I look at images and you look at my images, you'll see they're cropped tight because again, it makes the main subject larger in the frame. Why do I want to make it small and have a whole bunch of space of negative nothing around it? Um, this one here is, uh, I see again, spacing wise, pretty much got the spacing about the same up there and here, maybe a little tighter over here, a little wider over here. So you could balance it out. But uh, I think what he's doing here is just kind of putting the bug in the center of the frame, uh, which, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, um, you, you know, you shouldn't center your subject. But the thing is about this subject is that the background is just kind of consistent all the way through. So, um, you know, I don't know. I always tell people if you're going to, um, if you're gonna, whoops, hang on a second here. If you're going to, um, you know, crop your image or put it in the thirds, there's two other thirds to the image, and there's got to be something in those two other thirds that fills that area up that's interesting. Otherwise, it doesn't work in the thirds. This one here, if he would have shot it so that it was like a uh, 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 you know, the framing was the standard horizontal framing, he would have a lot of gap on the left side uh, with nothing there. So it wouldn't work in the third. So it works many times when you have a subject where it's just a plain background like he has here, it's, it works real well, just put in the center of the frame. Now, again, if he wanted to crop a little bit, you could maybe bring it in a little bit here and it would kind of offset the, the critter a little bit. If, if you're thinking that maybe it'd be better off in that third, see now it kind of brings them over, the body kind of moves over into the third, but I didn't think it was all that bad, kind of centered the way it was. And I center a lot of images too, but again, it's dependent on what's in the background because if I put it in the thirds and there's you know two other thirds of the image with nothing there or nothing interesting, then that's not, not working well. 
Uh, so this one's a, it's pretty cool critter, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and it contrasts really well against this kind of earth tones of the wood bark in the back. This is another one with a little more higher f-stop, you would have got some sharper details over on the right side. Uh, but you know, whatever f-stop he chose on this, it didn't get everything in focus and it would just go to a higher f-stop. All right, so again, I'm gonna go in and sharpen it up. Just add a little sharpness in there, make all the little fine details that you see in there. And uh, this one again, you see how our cropping is all over. It's like big gap here. Gaps over here are pretty equal, but then a smaller gap up here. So again, this is one of those images that uh, um, like I was saying, it works pretty well in the center, but then you want to try to get your cropping equal all the way around. And then again, once you crop it in, guess what happens to the main subject? It gets larger in the frame again. It fills the frame more. And that's what you want. You want those leaves in the background are not all that interesting, but this is where all the, the main part and the most interesting part. So subject matter is interesting. Uh, again, um, just needed to tighten up the crop on it. Now this is, uh, again, with this program, if you wanted to see, so you could go through and click on different filters. Look at how it darkened that background down. And, and actually that makes the flower stand out better, right? When you darken that down like that. So that's what's what's cool about this program. It's got so many different filters that you can apply to images. What's the name of your program again, Mike? Uh, Smart Photo Editor. Look at this one and what's here. And what's the cost of that, just so everybody knows? Twenty twenty nine dollars. Oh, wow. Yeah, Great. exactly. I mean, it's it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So look at this one here. It blacks the background out. So it's it's really a cool program uh, because again, you can do all kinds of creative stuff. Uh, you can, let's say on that image, you wanted to add in, um, you know, a textured background on it or something. They've got all types of different textures and weird things that you can do to your images. I've used this filter quite a few times. This one has yeah, another one. You can just add a little texture in the background. So, it, but there's 620 some pages of those filters. So there's so much you can do. And again, when you look at the cost, I mean, it's ridiculously low. But this is what I use all the time, though. So is that available for Mac and PC? Uh, I would assume it is. Yeah. I mean, I've always used PC, so I never check to see, but I would assume it is. Uh, so this is one of Robbie's images. And um, I, the, the subject matter looks good, looks sharp. And again, it's one of those images, like I'm saying, that it works well in the center, because if you would have shot this with this big gap over here on the uh, left side, if you put it in a standard, you know, format, a horizontal format, you'd have a huge gap of nothing here. So by him cropping it in, it just emphasized the main subject more. Now, uh, again, me personally, I tend to crop even tighter. I come in even tighter than what he has. And not to say that his is wrong or it's bad. It's just that I, I, I like it to be a tighter crop. So you see the gap he's got here. I'm going to try to get that same gap all the way around so that it equals all the way around the outsides. That way it's, it's consistent all the way around. And let's just add some sharpening to see what happens on this one. Now, I, this is just the plain sharpening here, but there's another one called HDR that I use quite a bit. But see how it adds more color in there? That one there just kind of sharpens. And the HDR one, which I use quite often, it actually adds more saturation into the colors. Uh, but I think it looks better with this one here. Uh, but if you look at, let's click the OK on this. So if we look at the, there's the original with, um, no sharpening. And then you look at that with the sharpening. It just really pulls out all those details, fine details. It always looks so much better. 
Um, I like his I like his background colors. I think the different shades look good, and they contrast really well with the uh, subject matter. So I think that worked out well. Now the only thing I don't care for is this kind of washed out area, and I don't know what that's causing that down there, uh, but that's kind of distracting. Uh, it would have been nice if it had more color. You know, Mike, that's the from background Robbie? is a uh, printed background that uh, you talked about in another. Okay, so what may have happened on your background is the light hit it and washed that area out. It's possible that's what happened because it it does it looks like it's kind of light hitting it, washing it out, and so it may be in the way you had it positioned behind your subject, the light might have been hitting it and kind of washing out your color down there because you got good strong color everywhere else except for right in there. But it's good subject. Uh, whose was this? Let me go back and look again. Oh, this is Robbie's too. Okay, so this one here, um, again, we're going to hit that sharpening because uh, it's going to pull out so much detail in there. All right, so look at the little hairs, how much finer you can see all the little hairs and all this stuff. And there's the original. That's the original. And then look at how it pulled out all that little detail, that fine detail. So you get all those little hairs on the edges. Same with this one here, um, just tighten up the crop. And again, that seems to be what most of them I see. You just don't need that much gap over here. Now, this is something too, is that I would, I would like to bring it down tighter, a little tighter here and a little tighter on the sides here, but now we're kind of cutting into this line here. So what I would probably do is in Photoshop, cut off some, you know, clone that line out of there so that it's not going up and touching the edge of the frame. Same with this one. I'd probably just clone it right out of there. So now again, you fill in the frame a little more. And it depends on what Robbie's after. If he's trying to get a more of a soft focused look, um, that's okay, but you still need to have something sharp you know, like, see, this one's like more out of focus, didn't sharpen very well, but these two here sharpened pretty well. So the other nice thing about this program is you can go up here, so you see how you've got three different, there's the original image that I brought in, and then you can go to the sharpened version, that's the sharpened, and then you can see you get the crop. And then if you add another filter on here, so let's just go in here and pull out something else. Okay, so if we add this one here, which is just kind of increase some of the color in the background. So we can go back and click on it, or not click on it, but just hover over this first one is your original. Then you go to the second slide, slide it here. And now you see the sharpening. Then you go over here, you see the crop. And then you see the little extra darkness in the background there. Just pull in a little darkness on that filter. And then when you get done, of course, you can just go into file, save as, and it'll save it for you. Now we have Catherine, Catherine Turner. All right, so feathers, I like feathers. If you look at my website, you'll see I've got tons of images with feathers and I put them on subjects, just like uh, I'm assuming that's uh, what Catherine did here. She put this on this background um, and um, feathers are really cool subjects. Uh, so this is another one that you're gonna see so much the detail in the veining here pop out when we sharpen it. So there's the original, and then there's a little bit of sharpening that's added in there. You can see the details and even the wood in the background, how it pops out more. Again, there's the original, and there's with the sharpening. Really makes all the details and the veining and stuff. You can see more of the veining, and otherwise it's with, so when it's soft, it just kind of blurs out. Um, now, I'm assuming she put this on this stump. Now, I don't care for all this kind of grainy um, stuff here. I would have rather seen part of the tree trunk that was like more like this here without all those little specks on it, because I think it would have contrast better. These are kind of, you know, blending in with the white feather. Um, and if it would have been all 
just the tree trunk behind it, that darker color, that would pop a lot more against that darker background. Whereas with this lighter background here, it kind of gets, you know, blends in with the feathers and the hairs don't stand out as much uh, as if it was this darker wood all the way around it. Um, so that would be the only thing. Now, as far as the cropping, I think she did fine on the cropping. Um, you know, just, a, a, and again, see the gap between here and here and the gap between there and there are equal. And then she's got the nice diagonal line of the uh, feather and that's good. Uh, so the feather is good, the cropping's good. It's just, it would be nice if you had uh, more of a consistency of this trunk in the background instead of all this um, little specks of stuff here. See whose was this? I keep forgetting to look. Catherine's again. Catherine Turner. Tooney, Turney, something. I like this one. I like it a lot. This one has kind of a, a soft feel to it, kind of almost like a filter that applied that give it a dreamy look. You know what I mean? And and kind of a dreamlike quality. And I think that came out really really nice. Um, this little, uh, I don't know if it's a plant or something that's hanging on the outside or a piece of jewelry or something. I can't really identify exactly what it is, but uh, I think that looks nice there, kind of just kind of coming out of the cup. And you notice it's kind of in that thirds, right? Uh, right in that thirds. And the cup is kind of in the thirds of the frame too. But as I said earlier, you know, there's two other thirds of the frame, right? So she's got kind of this part over here working. So that works well. Now, in order to keep her framing so that she doesn't touch the edge here uh, and then keep her framing kind of on the outside of her subject here, you're going to have this big gap up here. And that's just kind of the way it is on that subject. And that's OK. Now, it's possible she could have rotated the camera so that she was you know, coming in more like this angle here, possibly, um, and, and then maybe captured more of this subject uh, if she would have angled a little more but then it would have just caused a bigger gap up here probably. So I think it worked out real well. Uh, I, I like the subject matter. I like the, the softness. And uh, this one here is one like say, you know, all the other ones I've been kind of sharpening, but I don't know if you'd want to necessarily sharpen it. You see how it's real sharp now? Let's take the slider back and all the way down. There's the original. And then we added that sharpening in there. So you can see it does sharpen it, but I think I actually like kind of the soft dreamy look better. And that kind of looks what she was after on this one. So that one worked out pretty cool. And this is Gale Sheets. Okay, so this one here, um, I like this, the kind of the subject matter and what she's, you know, doing here with this stuff here. I'm not sure I like this gap up here in the corner. And whether this adds to the image, I don't know, maybe. Uh, again, getting into that cropping thing. I think we've got, again, way too much over here that is not needed. So I would crop it in. And if we cropped it in, we'd get rid of that corner up there that I mentioned. Now, the other option is you could just crop it down so that you have just the needles and then get rid of this little black here by, you know, cloning that out and then just emphasize the needles and the texture on, of the uh, background. And again, if we crop it or sharpen it, So let's see, there's without the sharpening and then there's with sharpening. Look at the difference in the background. Really pulls out the textures and the details. Um, but uh, again, to me again, you know, when we look at this, here's the main subject right in here where the needles are. And I'm not sure that uh, this works real well. And then this little gap here doesn't work as well. I don't think so. We crop it down and then sharpen. Okay. 
Another one of Gales. And I think this one here works out pretty good the way it is. Again, just, you know, it's a little bit softer. There's the original. And then with some sharpening added, you can again, pull in, watch in this area here, how it pulls in the details. Um, I think this one works okay. I mean, the way it is. Uh, she's got a little bit of the background, which is good up here. Uh, maybe a little more gap would have been good because you're really close to touching the edge there. So probably a little bigger, bigger gap up here. And I think that background looks kind of interesting. So it might have been interesting to see a little more of that background on the top portion here. Um, and it would give a little more contrast between the background and the subject. But uh, I think crop wise, it came out okay. And then I like she's got the lines. See, the lines are kind of on an angle coming out of the corner there all around here. This is another one, like I said, I would go through and clone out all these little white specks. And you'd be amazed the difference if you saw before and after, if you cloned all that stuff out. Um, but, uh, and, and then you got the little shiny spot here. Now, whether you could, you know, want to eliminate that by using a diffuser over top. Again, a diffuser will just kind of, uh, get rid of all that real kind of whitish blown out stuff there. It's so important to use those diffusers to get rid of all that glare and stuff. But I think that turned out okay. And Ginger. Hello. Hey, Ginger. All right, so I think this is a really nice image but it would have Thank been you. nice to see but. the pedal on the edge there. <laughs> so I was, was doing this in an internal bathroom with the lights out. So, <laughs> okay. I think the lighting looks really good on it. Um, you know, it's kind of just centered right here and it kind of emphasized the center of the flower. And then it's kind of a little darker on the outside. Um, again, with the uh, cropping on the, on the top, see the gap you have here. Again, I would just, yeah. I would do the same on the top, bring it down so that it balances with the gap you got on the, uh, you, you just don't need as much up there as you've got. And, and when you're, when you're framing up a subject, um, you're never going to get it framed uh, exactly the way you want the finished product, you know, um, because of the framing of the camera, it may not allow you to crop uh, the way you want it to be uh, cropped in the final, but we have that ability obviously to, to crop once we get it into our program. All right, uh, but so you've got the gap here, which is good. You got almost the same amount of gap over here as you do down here, that's good. And then like I say, we'll try to get that same gap up here so it equals out all the way around. Now, I think it would have been nice, again, if you maybe included the pedal here with the little gap like you have over here so you get to see the whole pedal. Uh, but at least like I was saying earlier, you cropped in enough to show that maybe you wanted it out of the frame. You know, maybe there was something on the yeah, end. Because the, the edge of it was all decayed or something dark and dead. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's exactly what I was talking about earlier when I said there's been times when I have done that myself where I cropped off a part of a subject because there was uh, some decay or there was, it, like you said, it was black and dead or something so that it just wouldn't be appealing to leave it in the scene. So then, you know, I've done the same thing where I crop just to get rid of something that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to fix in, in post-processing. So uh, again, if we try to do a little, I always, you know, check the sharpening just to see, you know, if it does it improve it or does it need to be or not. But I think it, again, like most images I, I look at, I think it always improves it. So there's the image without the sharpening and there that's with the sharpening. So you can see the fine details and the petals pop out more and you can see more sharpness in all the, the stamens and stuff here. So, but other than that, yeah. it's a very nice, you know, very nice subject. And I like the vase and, and the background looks really good. Um, and the lighting, like I say, is nice. You got kind of nice lighting in the center here. So that worked out real yeah. well. And another one of gingers. Same, same flower. <laughs> same thing. Um, so just less light. Well, you got more light in here. So this one here, and, and when you add a lot of light in here, a lot of times what it does is the camera is trying to get the exposure on this really bright area here. And what it does is it darkens down the exposure to the point where it kind of blacks out the background too. Um, but I like the last one much, much better. 
Um, this one here that's too contrasty between how white these are, and you've actually got to the point where you've lost your color in here, and it washed yeah, out the color. Yeah. And so you've got so much contrast between this bright area and then the darker areas here. Uh, and then you kind of cut off your base. I think on the last one, it was nice how you kind of had a little gap down there at the bottom. So I think yeah, I think I told them to not huh? use this one and I sent another one, but obviously he had too many things getting sent to him. So yeah, he didn't possibly. get it. So, but, but this one okay. here is, uh, um, you know, uh, it's, it's mainly the lighting problem. I think that you have on this one. Okay. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Jerry. All right. So we have a nice little flower bouquet here. Okay, there's the original. And then I'm gonna add sharpening here. All right, so the original, you can see it's kind of soft in these centers. Look at the difference, watch the center of those flowers. Look at that, how sharp it is now. Uh, that's why these tools are so important. Um, so this, looks like um, geode, one of those geode centers of a geode. And he put the flowers in there. And that's cool because I do a lot of that. I do a lot of combining, especially out in nature. I take subjects and put them in other subjects. Uh, and that, that is, a, is a cool background for that. Um, probably, uh, I, I wouldn't do any crop on it. I think it's fine. Again, see how he cropped in, into the flower here? And that's okay. Probably this one is the only one that I wouldn't like is that's touching the edge of the frame. Remember I said, you got 99 point percent of the, uh, <laughs> the, the petal in the frame and then this fraction touching the edge of the scene. Over here, it's okay because you've cut into it. But here would have been nice to have a little gap up there. So you saw the whole petal there. Uh, and then again, like here, you've cropped into the flower, but that's okay. Uh, but it's just not okay to have the tip just the very tip, you know, like I say, I have 99.9% .9 of the thing in the frame and then have this little 0.01% out of the frame. Uh, but uh, I think it's nice that he's, he's kind of altered the colors. You got white and different colors, dark color and a little lighter one here. Again, with the little specks though, see all the little yellow specks, I just find that very distracting. I, I just, to me, it doesn't, doesn't look pretty at all. Um, so I would go and I would take the time to clone out all those specs or get rid of it or use like that buzz zim filter to eliminate all those and it, it makes such a huge difference. Now the only other issues would be you've got this whitish area down in here see these white areas and a lot of times white areas like that big bright white areas or even dark holes like this kind of pulls your eye into those areas away from your other stuff. So if this would have been you know, more of this stuff like we see up here, but down here, uh, more color in there instead of this big blob of white, um, that would have been better. And then you can always go in here and darken or lighten this area up in here if you wanted to. Uh, I do that all the time in Viveza and Nick Software. I'll drop a control point and just take the slide, brightness slider and brighten it right up and it'll come, come up to where you can almost get it up to the rest of it like you see in here. But uh, that, that, it's a cool concept, worked out good. And then I think Jerry has another one. This one here I liked a lot. I think this one came out really nice. See how it got in really tight and filled the frame? Yeah, I think that, that one worked out real well. And again, we'll add a little more sharpening in it. All right, so there's the original with no sharpening. And there's with the sharpening. Look how the detail pops out. All the textures pop out on that. Um, I like how he's cropped it in tight. Again, might have cropped it in. You see over here, this pedal to the edge there. But that would probably do the same on this pedal over here. Bring it in so that now you're cropping a little more there. Actually, it actually puts this more in the center of the frame. And he's got a little white vignette around the outside here. And I think the difference with this vignette compared to the one earlier where it was just, it was kind of washing out some color in a couple of key parts of the subject. Um, 
he's got so much cool stuff going on in this whole image right in here that doesn't really cause a problem with washing out kind of around the outside edges here where the subject is. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment about vignette. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've heard this, but vignette white and vignette black. Uh, vignette white kind of lost its luster and popularity, I think. I had heard this from other photographers a few years ago, mm -hmm. and it became a point where everybody is now doing the black vignette, very, very fine. Yeah, uh, I, I actually like the white vignettes. Yeah, I do too, but I'm and, just saying. And I've done it on yeah. quite a few images of mine. I put white vignettes, and I think that it looks really nice. Now, I do have a lot of black vignettes, um, but I actually do like, uh, I, I think this particular image works well with the white vignette. It kind of just softens mm -hmm. down the, the colors around the outsides. And I think that- Yeah, I only okay. mentioned that because I, I didn't know if you heard that or not, or if you, you're not seeing many white vignettes anymore like we used to. No, you know, I never heard that, um, but I, I would still use a white vignette mm -hmm. I, I don't because I think they look good. Um, so, and I think it looks good on this image. Let me show you something else in this program talking about vignettes. Now, um, when you go to your effects gallery, and you'll see, and, and look at all the different looks that you can get in that image there, all the different create creative things you can do with that. So you can go with something like that. It's amazing. Now look at the difference here too, how you see the kind of turned it all red in the center. Now watch how it turned it more yellow and it alters colors a lot of the times. And so it's, it's a pretty interesting program. And again, there's 655 pages of 12 filters per page. <laughs> so you can sit there and go through uh, endless amounts of this stuff, right? Just crazy. Look at this one. Let me go back to that one there. Look at this one right here. <laughs> Swirly. All right, so let's go back. Um, cancel this out. I want to show you uh, what you, the, the amount of vignettes you can do in this program. It's amazing. Now, if you go over to the left here, you'll see it right here. It says style, vignette, graphic, retro, and you click on vignette. There is 40 pages, 12 images per page, 40 pages of vignettes, whites and blacks. So you can do all kinds of, look at that vignette. That's a cool vignette. Uh, but you've got all different options and you can adjust these, you know, you've got controls here to adjust the circle in and out. So this has a huge amount of, you know, what is 40 times 12? That's a lot of vignettes. <laughs> so you can do a lot of different things with this program. It's amazing what you can do. That's why I said this is what I use on all my images that I process other than I go through and I'll do a, I'll do a couple uh, little tricks that I do in maybe Photoshop or, or uh, smart photo, or I mean, uh, Topaz or Nixoff or something like that. So this is one of those uh, seed pod things. Um, I've got these that I photograph in my uh, workshops uh, and they have the little beads or balls down in the center here. And so that's cool. Now this one here, again, it, it looks kind of like the colors have washed out. And again, it's probably the lighting, the way the lighting's hit it, I would assume to kind of wash out those colors. And it may have been just a matter of a diffuser over there to kind of bring the colors. So you got some really nice color working through all these areas and up in here, you see the nice color, but then all of a sudden you have all this white, white specks and washed out colors around the outside. Um, so let's do a little sharpening on this one. And I think the crop wise on this one works all right. Uh, look at this cool thing right there. You can add some colors in there. Look at that. That's, fun. That's amazing. All right, so let's go back to the grid. So on this one here, I would go with the HDR. See how it brought the color in? This is the one I've been using all the image, but the HDR, if you look at it, it brings more warm tones in there, darkens it down, brings more of the darker colors out. So we don't notice so much of the white ones where you see on the sharpening there, it doesn't do that, brings it in. And then again, we can go in um, to our programs with all the different, uh, well, we got to click okay on that, there we go. And you may even be able to find another one that'll darken it down more even. This one kind of darkens it down too. Brings a little more of the richer tones out. Okay. Hey, Mike. Yeah. Um, 
I did do some adjusting on topaz, AI yeah. topaz. Um, that is a lotus root. A lotus yeah, root. that's what it is, lotus. I, I couldn't remember the name of it, but I, yeah, I kind of, yeah. It's a, it's a cool root. subject. I just, yeah, I fell in love with it. And I decided that, you know, those are the only three seed pods, little seeds left in the <laughs> in it. We brought it back from Japan. And so I just thought, I just liked bats. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, I've got four or five of them. I use them in my my macro boot camps and at my macro conference where people are shooting tabletop stuff. And, and we've got these these pods and some of them have the seeds in them, some don't. Uh, but they're very interesting, you know, subjects. Yeah. And I think the cropping worked out okay. Uh, here's here's the main interest. You know, this is kind of interesting, this little area right here. And, and then you get to see kind of these half circles that are black holes and that's kind of works out good. So I think that uh, other than, like I said, maybe with the diffuser, uh, I, I don't know if you use any artificial lighting out here to light it. Oh, no. In fact, I think I closed our curtains so that it wouldn't be so bright. Yeah. And I don't know why this turned out so white like it is yeah. on all these. I think. I'm because going, I know mine aren't like that. I can go over and look at it. I think it's kind of white. I'll go look. Yeah, mine, mine are not like that. They're all just kind of that brown tone and you don't have that. Again, if I was to shoot them with some light and hit them at a certain angle, it would kind of wash out colors and stuff like that. But, uh, and maybe yours is different. Maybe yours is like that. A little bit. Yeah, it's got some white parts in it. Yeah, but when you see it here, does it have that many white parts? Um, does it look that white? No, actually yeah. not. Yeah, I wouldn't think it would. So I'm thinking it was just the lighting, the way the light was coming in somehow, just hitting it just right. It's got that little round circle up in the left, top left. Um, yeah. There, the, there. This yeah. one here is kind of washed out too. Yeah. But it's a cool subject though. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I bought some at, um, you know, one of the craft stores, Hobby Lobby or one of those or Michael's or whatever. All right, so this is another one of Belinda. And I like this one. This is really cool. Is this some kind of a fabric, right? It is a, it's called Tamari. It's a little round, um, if I can get it. It's, it's, yeah, it's yarn. Yeah. A little round ball. And so I couldn't, I didn't like how in the bottom, left bottom, uh -huh. I could not get it as sharp, you know, the, the threads as it was in the right hand, top right hand. So yeah. I, brought it in um, to the very center. Yeah, and, and again, just go to the highest f-stop and you'll get the whole thing in focus. And then with any softness you get from the diffraction, as you can see, we can just sharpen it up with our sharpening tools. This was either 29 or 32 one of, or, or even 25. Yeah, well, I think after we finished up last week um, talking, uh, a lot of these macro lenses, you know, they'll say they go up to 32, but they actually go higher than that when you're in really close. So a lot of people don't realize that. So they think they're at 32 and that's the highest, but they actually, I've had them go up to 54 and 62. Um, and, and then you need to even go up higher than that. So this is, right. this is what it is. Oh yeah, it's a cool subject. And it's supposed to be, I think, a toy for Japanese kids. Yeah, and I, and I think you balanced it really well as far as you know the consistency around the edges so that you know this is centered. And, and that's what I was saying that you know, sometimes centered subjects work really well. Um, so if we add, all right, so we look at, this is the original right here. And then once I add the sharpening, you'll see a lot of that details pop. And I did sharpen it on Topaz. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, this program does a great job pulling out details though. And you know, there are six pages of different levels of sharpening in this program. So I always just hit that number one sharpening, but there's other ones you can hit too. Uh, now, the other thing I would do is see this little line here? Uh, yeah. I would get rid of that. It would clone that out and get rid of it. Um, it's just, an, it's a distraction that pulls your eye over there and it's not doing anything to help your image better, right? You're right. I don't even see it on the ball. So the camera caught it and my eye can't even catch it. Oh, you're exactly right. I mean, it's amazing what a camera catches that your eye doesn't see. Um, so those are the things in your post-processing. You have to go around and look at all the image everywhere. There's even a little one of those little white lines right here. Uh, and I go through my image and I, I, I look at the whole image all the way through all different areas and any little things like that, uh, that might be a distraction that pulls your eye away from what's the best part. Uh, I'm going to clean all that out of there. All right, thank you. Yeah. 
Oh, I keep forgetting to look at the names. It's Michael. And this, Michael Atkins. All right, Michael. This is a really cool image. Um, I kind of consider myself a nature photographer, but I do a lot of images of subjects like, you know, something like this would be a cool subject to photograph. And I love the, the light background that he's got this kind of bright yellow back here it just really makes it stand out, you know, the contrast with this darker stuff up here. Um, probably the only thing is again cropping, you see your gap here, I would probably bring this in so you have the same gap on this side. And then uh, again, your subject kind of fills the frame a little more than it did with that big gap over there. Um, and it actually kind of took this out of the center, brought it over a little more. Here's the third of the frame right here. So you're getting close to your third of the frame. And if you want to bring in a little more, you could actually put that needle pretty much right on the third, you know, um, if you're worried about the thirds. Uh, but see all this gap over here? You don't really need that because again, like I always tell people, it's like when you look at this area right here, is there anything within this area that makes your image a better image? Well, how can it? There's nothing there. Um, so, you know, to me, I always get rid of that stuff. Now, there are people that have a, a different opinion. Now, you know, a lot of times you'll see landscape photographers will shoot a tree with all this big nothing around the outside of the tree. You know, the tree is a little small tree in a landscape and there's nothing around it. Uh, and they want that negative space. It's a different style of photography. I look at macro as that I'm looking at fine details. I'm looking at the all that interesting stuff within that subject and I wanna fill the frame with it more. So I always wanna eliminate space, but I think it's a really cool subject and I like how you did this, uh, whatever that light is in the background that came out really nice. Now, the only other issue is this blue area right here. See now it's like, well, where does this blue fit in? <laughs> so I would probably take this darker area here and clone it over top of that blue area and get rid of that blue area right there because it has no place in there. I mean, it's just this little blob of blue. Um, so I would get rid of that. Again, those are the things that kind of pull your eye and that's where my eye goes, well, what's this blue thing down here doing there? So I would clone, huh? The light is really the logo. This is just an old sewing machine that Belinda had hanging around. Uh -huh. The light is really just the logo in the background that's blurred. It's okay. Yellow. The yellow, yeah. Yeah, and you can, like I say, you can alter that. I know in Viveza, you can go in there and you can click on that and take the saturation out. It'll take it out so that it'll blend in more with this background over here. Or you could go in there and clone this darker color, just clone it over top of there and get rid of it. Um, I didn't do any sharpening. That's just for the fun of it. See what this would look like with some more sharpening in it. So it's so much more detailed now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get, take this. There we go. All right, so there's the original with no sharpening, and then there's with the sharpening. So you can see the details, the, all the fine details really pop out. Uh, and then again, I would go through it, even those little light, these little white specks, I would clean all that. It's, it's amazing the difference how this would look so much nicer if it's just all solid instead of all these little specks all over. But it's pretty clean, most of it, just a few little, little specks here and there. But I think it came out really nice. I like that a lot. Again, I, I like a lot of uh, non-nature subjects. I don't necessarily promote them a lot, but uh, I do a lot of non-nature stuff. I do have them on my website, but, and let's go back. Uh, who was that? Was that another one of yours, Michael? Okay. So again, ah, oh, crap. I do the same thing. <laughs> All right, so another one with some really cool stuff. I like um, subjects like this because there's so much interesting things going on in there, right? Um, you know, you got so many different shapes and different types of shapes that makes it interesting. And so I, I like stuff like that. I think it come out good. You got, you know, lines here and you got different, different types of shapes, round shapes. And this is like a heart shape and, and you've got this other weird shape going here. and this other weird thing here. So, and there's something up here and, and little gear popping in. So I think it's pretty cool. And as far as your, and, and, you know, we talked about the, the, the cropping, you see, you got the crop here, it's same, pretty much the same here, the same over here. So that worked out real well. Um, and then you got the same up here too. So pretty much your cropping all the way around your subject is pretty consistent. So that's a good thing. Um, probably the only thing I would do is I would clone this out, that little white thing. Again, I don't see where it adds anything to the image, but now this one here, if you go and sharpen this one, you're going to see a lot of texture pop out on that. 
All right. Okay, so there's the original. Look at the texture that pops out. Now it almost looks blurry, right? Right. When you go to that one and then go to that one. And you don't have to have, you know, leave it that much texture. You can back this off. That's what they have the master fade for. So if you said, hey, let's just do half that amount of texture. See, so you get some more texture. If we take it all the way out, it tends to look like it's a little soft. And then you start adding a little texture in just enough to add a little extra kick in there. You don't have, and obviously this is what we talk about when we get over texture, right? It starts to look pixelated. Uh, so we can take that and just add a little bit just to make the, uh, the, you know, all the texture pop out a little more. So I think that one's a pretty cool image. And, and again, cropping wise, everything looks pretty good. Um, probably the only thing like I say is, is these little specks here. Again, I would go and clone all those little specks out of there and see a speck right there, little specks in here little speck there, just any little specks anywhere, even that black one or this one here doesn't fit with the rest of it around it. So I would get rid of it and I would get rid of this guy right here. So, to be honest, I almost cropped it only to get that middle screw because that thing sticking in there is really interesting when you get in really close. Uh -huh. you're, you're right, it's, uh, I mean, the little thing in the screw that you wanted to clone out, um, but in the bigger picture, yeah, it looks, it's more distracting. Yeah. Um, the thing is, when you're shooting old stuff like this, you are always going to have those little specks all over. I mean, you just can't avoid it. I mean, there's just nothing that I've ever shot like this kind of stuff that didn't have all these little dirt specks and white specks and stuff like that. Even up in here, see on your nice black, you've got all these little specks. That can all be cleaned up and you'd be amazed the difference in how it looks when it's cleaned up. Thank you. <clears throat> Sonia, this is a Sonia picture. Sonia texted me that she is down south with her grandkids and will be watching the uh, recording. Cool. All right, so she's got some flies uh, mating here. And you know how they always talk about um, when you're shooting wildlife or bugs that you always want to have the eyes in focus. And so she's done a well, you know, well to get that in focus on this front one here. Now, it might have been interesting to have a little more depth of field. So we got both of them in focus. Um, and maybe a little sharpening will help that. Look how much difference that made. Let's go back again. We'll look at the original. There's the original and you can see the two bugs, his face is, is pretty focused, but then when we add the sharpening in there, it goes from that to that right there. So then we get a little bit more detail in the back one and a lot more detail in the front guy here. Um, now this one here, uh, again, cropping wise, you got a huge gap up here, huge gap down here uh, that you don't really need. So this would kind of become more of a panoramic a little bit bring this in and again i'll try to balance the top and the bottom gaps and then you don't need that much out here so we can bring this in and then now if you wanted to leave this like this see the flies are kind of in that third of the frame but as i said uh do you have that anything that's that much much you know we have much interest over in the right side a uh, little bit not a lot so you could bring it in a little bit over here and now they come larger in the frame. I can see them a lot better uh, and see all the details that he's got in the body up here. Uh, again, little black spots this time, clone them out. Little black spot right there, I clone that out. So, but that's an interesting find, you know, to, to capture something like that's always cool. And we've got a nice fruity drink here with some ice in it. And some, looks like you've got the, the, the white specks now, it's kind of, you know, re, you know, making you think that there's water drops on the outside, the moisture from the cold glass, right? Um, so, so that's, looks okay, because again, it's kind of representing the dew drops or the water drops that are on the outside. 
Now, um, the background, you know, this kind of whitish area kind of pulls my eye. I like this background a lot right here, but this area here, because they're just big white areas, um, kind of my eye kind of goes, whoa, right down there and looks at these two white things and try, well, what are those little white things? Over here, there's just some shades of color. So I'm not trying to analyze and figure out what is it. Over here, I'm looking and going, I wonder what that is over here. And it doesn't really show much of itself. So it'd been nice if you had this background over here as well. So it'd be a little more consistent. Uh, but, uh, and this one, I don't know if I would sharpen it because I think when you add sharpening to this one, all this, what looks like kind of water drops. Um, and it may be, and I'm sure there's like moisture there, but it's like the, the, um, uh, Mm, let's see what I'm looking for here. Uh, the um, light, the way it's hitting it is kind of uh, making it stand out more. Oh, there you can see it much better now. You can see the details a lot better in the, uh, uh, the moisture that's on the outside there. There's the uh, original and there's with the sharpening. And it may be where we don't want that much sharpening because like I said, um, just a little bit, there would be the, uh, that would be a lot of sharpening there. But that would be the only thing I would say is maybe a little less over here and there. The other thing about images like this is it's a tall, skinny subject. Uh, and I mentioned this in my program last week. Uh, if it's a tall, skinny subject, I tend to do it as a, uh, you know, frame it as a vertical rather than a horizontal, see, like that. And you kind of eliminate those two big white areas. And uh, now, now it's, uh, again, tall, skinny subject fits a little better in the uh, vertical frame than a horizontal frame. And this is an image that's kind of what I was talking about earlier about negative space. And this is one of those type of images that he's, who is this? this let me go back and look. Spencer, this is Spencer's image. Base. I always do that. Let's go back and bring it in again. Okay, Spencer. So this looks like he was purposely trying to create this negative space around the subject. And so if that was his intention, he did a good job because there's nothing there behind the subject that uh, you know would make it uh, appear that he was trying to include other things in the you know background in the in the subject. He just wanted a nice, clean, solid background. Uh, nice, sharp details on this one here. You can see the all the lettering here is nice and sharp, um, and it's getting a little bit of a shadow down here. It looks like the way the light's coming in here. It's kind of uh, side lighting kind of hitting the side here and it's kind of shaded on this side and that's good. Uh, I, when I do uh, my program in my macro boot camp, we talk about side lighting where, you know, kind of like a portrait photographer would would light up the side of a face and then the other side is in the shadow. And so that's kind of what he's done here and that looks good. So I think this works okay um, because I think what he was trying to accomplish was negative space around the outside and just your eye goes right to the subject. And then again, it's got some nice lighting where you get this side lighting on the, on the subject. Gretchen. All right, so Gretchen has that problem we talked about earlier. Tip of the pedal touching the edge of the frame. Need to have a little bit of a gap there. And again, whether you want a big gap or a small gap, it doesn't matter, but you got, I mean, they don't obviously don't want a huge gap, but you want to have some kind of gap there. You don't want to uh, have that tip touching the edge of the frame. Um, the part that I like the best is this right here. It's one of those Christmas cactuses. We have one of those in our home. Um, and this gets really cluttery, okay? Really cluttery over here. Uh, and so what you want to do is try to, th this is really simplified and it's very, uh, very nice the way it forms and it folds down. You got a little bud right here and it comes down and kind of angles out. So this area is really nice, uh, but this over here gets too cluttered up 
and it gets distracting. So I would have tried to pull this out of the way, get it out of the way, and then your, your frame of your subject would have been something like, that right there see and you still could fix this by cloning this out and cloning this out um, now i i don't do it or i haven't i know you can do it but you can actually add what they call canvas in photoshop so you can take this whole area here and then you can extend your frame out here a little bit and then this gets cloned into that frame and so you'll have a gap there. So you will have a gap. And then I would clone this stuff out and clone this out. And I think this simplifies the image so much more and it comes down really nice in a nice little angle right here down into the corner. So that really came out nice. Um, the background, uh, I would probably go in there and soften that a little bit more just to, to you know, so they don't see as much detail. Uh, and then this would stand out more if this was a little softer in the background, a little softer down here. And you can do that in Viveza. I do it again. I'll go into Nick software and go into Viveza. You can drop a control point right here. And then you can take the uh, sharpen slider and slide it all the way to the left. And it'll actually soften that down really nice. And then soften this darker area down here with another control point. So I would do this crop here and then eliminate these things here. And then if you have the skills, add canvas here to add a little gap there. And another one of Gretchen's. All right, so let's look at this subject. And as I mentioned in the last week's program, first thing I, I, I have to decide, is it a tall subject or it is a wide subject? And this is a tall subject. It's taller than it is wide. And when you shoot it as a horizontal, you're gonna have this huge gap here and huge gap here with nothing of, that's adding any interest to your, your image. This is the main part. And so you wanna make that fill the frame better. So you would want to shoot this as a vertical rather than a horizontal. And when you shoot it as a vertical, it's gonna fill the frame better. Now, what we have to do is we gotta, we gotta stay outside this pedal here. Remember I said, so we gotta have a gap there. So you see the gap from the red to here. I wanna to try to match it up on this side. So I get the same amount of gap from the red to here. And then we're gonna apply that. And now it fills the frame much better than that there. Now you here you've got all that space around there. Now you fill the frame better. And then we'll add a little sharpening in there. Now let's go, uh, let's click OK. And we go to the, there's the crop version without the sharpening. And there's with the sharpening. Look how it pulled all the edges out and all the nice details and brought in more of the base and the little thing down here. So there's the original, there's with the sharpening. And then if you wanted to get creative, you could go in and start looking at different filters, you know. So many different filters. Like I said, I think there's seven to 8,000 different filters. Oh, another one I'll show you in here is borders. If you like borders, I, for a while there I was doing all kinds of borders. Here's seven pages of different types of borders, black borders, white borders, vignette type borders. So you got all these different options for different borders. There's like say seven pages of them. And that's just the, uh, that's just what's called classical borders. Then they have vintage borders and you've got, you know, contemporary borders and creative borders and just so much there. So, all right, that was pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna close this out and um, that's gonna be it for this part. Now I'm gonna take a break real quick here. All right, and then I'll come back and do some more stuff, okay? Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna leave Mike's screen up for a minute here. Uh, I learned a lot. How about you guys? You can unmute yourselves. Yes, I did. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Cool. Well, we've been at it for almost two hours here. So it'll be interesting to see what else Mike comes up with. But uh, 
Uh, we did actually I think we an hour it. and a half. <laughs> yeah. yeah, from the time it actually started. Yeah. We, right. Uh, yeah. The critique. That's an amazing part. program. That's yeah. just an amazing program that he showed us. Yeah. And I encourage you all to consider uh, joining his club. I, you know, I was fortunate enough to be one of the two winners. Belinda got the other one. Uh, but uh, Michael, you're already in there, right? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard to do three hours without a bathroom break. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As we get older, it seems like I go a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Right. Uh, I'm going to give the screen back to you. Okay. So I was just going to say I have a question about the membership that I won last week. Yeah. Last week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it would have been last week. How do I how do I go about um know you know that you know that it was me and I. Um, just email me. Okay. Um, uh, or you can go to my website and click on the contact and just. Okay. And then, then let me know that you're the winner, and I will send you the welcome letter. All right, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. I look forward to it. I had fun doing these macro shots. Oh, they are a blast. It was like, oh, well, let me try this. Oh, well, let me try this. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mike, this is Barbara. Yeah. I want to let you know that the I had the one with the little spores, about the fifth one in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That wasn't a tree. It was actually a piece of mulch. It was only about two inches long. Oh, and wow. A half inch wide. Oh. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it looked like really, a tree trunk. Yeah, it was really tiny. It was just a piece of, a piece of mulch that I picked up <laughs> while I was mulching. <laughs> well, you got in really close then. It, well, it was on a dining room table. I brought it in. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Mike, yeah. on the uh, close up, image I had there I just wanted to tell you uh, I, it was I used all three extension tubes on and uh, at a 55 millimeter on the lens I had to turn the ceiling fan off and then uh, I hate to tell you this but I had to turn the air conditioning off also uh -huh. <laughs> I know you don't use air conditioning up there right now <laughs> no. in Michigan yeah. we, I sure use it in the summertime though <laughs> When I was doing my workshop in the bathroom, it was 82 inside my house because my air conditioning is broke. So that was fun. Hey, what's the temperature no. today down there? Um, oh, today it's only in the 70s. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's perfect. No, it's you, cold. You guys should, yeah, a little you breeze. Guys, you guys should come up here. It was like 15 degrees earlier. No, thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> Ooh, no, no, no. Just hearing it makes me cold. <laughs> yep. Right now. Yeah, that's pretty I'm moving yeah. south next winter. You are? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I have a question regarding diffusers. Uh-huh. Um, when do you use the uh, the smaller diffuser with the white on the one side and the gold on the other side? No, that's a reflector. Okay. Yeah, that reflects light. It's uh, a diffuser is a as a translucent white material. So that it does allow some light to filter through, but it just gets rid of all the bad light. It gets rid of all the real, the real sharp stuff. Okay. Yeah, the one you're talking about is is actually a reflector. That's they come what with, I have. I got yeah. three of those, but I don't. I mean, have a you can use that as a diffuser, yeah. but the problem is, is it does block all the light. You it know, it blocks not, the light. That's the yeah. problem. It yeah. blocks too much light. So yeah, get yourself a 12-inch reflector, or I'm sorry, <laughs> a diffuser. Yeah. Yeah. What what company? Uh, the um, same one. Promaster. Promaster. Okay. Well, actually, the links that you should have got some links with some sales stuff from Hunt's Photo. Yeah. They've got it in there. It's like regular fifteen dollars for nine ninety five. That's not bad. You just click on the link, and you know it'll take you to there for the nine ninety five price. It's hard to find them in local stores because um, local stores they don't sell a lot of that size, that small twelve inch size. So they tend to um, not carry them or it's harder to find them in stock. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, Hunts and B&H, places like that, they carry that stuff all yeah, the time. Yeah. Because they they carry everything. Yeah. But a little, little uh, you know, stores around your neighborhood, sometimes they don't have enough money to buy all the different things that they 
they could carry. And so they kind of, they, they carry usually the 20 inch model or the yeah. larger sizes, but not so much that 12 inch. Well, the size. problem here in South Florida is we don't have any little stores. We don't have any stores at all. Yeah. And that's go down to Miami. Yeah. That's pretty common, you know, as all the, all the B and H's of the world and the Hunts and Adoramas and all those took over the internet. Yeah. Um, people started buying from those places and they, they abandoned their small little stores, independent yeah. stores. We had a chain up here that had five different camera stores. I mean, they had a, a, a you know five stores in five different cities, and and you know you would go in there and you'd say, hey, I want to buy this product here, and and uh, and and they would say, well, it's going to be this much money, and they said, well, B and H is selling it for this much, and they go, well, cripe, that's that's what we pay wholesale for it, you know, and B and H yeah. is selling it at the retail price at that. So those stores couldn't compete. They all went out of business. But uh, recently, in the last few years, they've come up with what they call maps, pro, uh, maps pricing. And so none of these stores like B&H and Hunts and Adoram and all those big, big stores, uh, they can't advertise the, the cheap prices that they have anywhere. Um, they have to all have kind of the same pricing as the small stores. And it was to help the small stores so they didn't get undercut on price. Yeah, yeah. Now they can run specials. They yeah. can do specials to lower the price. But as far as like if Tamron lenses, if b &H sells a Tamron lens and your local camera store sells a, a Tamron lens, they got to sell them at the same price. Sure. But that's not to say that, that b &H or Hunts can't say, well, we're going to run a special this month <laughs> and you're going to yeah. get it at this price, you know? Yeah, they do that anyhow. Yeah. All right, so you guys see my image here? Yeah. With all the people? <laughs> yeah. Lots of people. Yeah. So if you were to go to Yosemite, um, there's, a, there's an image that uh, Ansel Adams made famous in one of his books. And everybody goes and, and wants to get in the exact same spot that Ansel shot it at. Uh, and that's why you see them all congregated right in that area right there. Uh, and it's just, to me, it's just kind of crazy and ridiculous. So uh, I was in Yosemite in 2004, and that's when I quit doing landscape photography because I'd been shooting for three years and I wasn't sure, you know, which direction I wanted to go. I was doing landscape, I was doing wildlife photography, and I was doing macro. Uh, and when I went to Yosemite in 2004, and, I, you know, I saw this kind of stuff going on at, at all these scenes, I thought, well, why, why would I want to shoot something that's been shot you just millions of times, you know, over all the years since back in the 40s, 1940s, when Nansel shot these images, I guess, uh, why would I want to shoot the exact same shot that he took? Uh, it, you know, you're just copying what everybody else has done. And, and, it, and it, when you show those images to people, they're not impressed by them because they've seen them done the exact same way so many times. And I just don't understand the mindset of people wanting to do the exact same scenes as everybody else's photographs. So my thought was, you know, I would rather be doing something different than shooting the same thing that all these people are shooting. Um, and that's kind of the, that, that trip there was when I decided that I wanted to just quit landscape photography and do macro photography because uh, I didn't want to fall into that trap like all these other people and shooting all the same exact scenes all the time. And, and they're shooting good scenes. I mean, they're good. That's why they're all shooting it because it's a great composition, great subject matter. Um, but I also didn't have the time or, uh, you know, to travel uh, to, to do a lot of good landscape photography where you have to go out west to get all a lot of that good stuff. Um, so with macro photography, I could do it right in my four parks near my home and in my backyard if I wanted to. Uh, so I said, you know, I've got so much more subject matter close to home and I don't have to travel. So I'm just going to dedicate my time to being a macro photographer. Now, this is something that, um, you know, talking about shooting the same things that everybody else is shooting and shooting the same compositions over and over and just copying what everybody else does. That's kind of what happens in, in macro photography. We see the same shots over and over and over the same subjects. So I was at this uh, Duke University Gardens and uh, there was a, one of the ladies that was in my workshop over the weekend had uh, joined me there on a Monday and she was excited because the tulips were out. And she had her tripod on this little pathway. You see that stone pathway there. She had her tripod real low to the ground and she framed up one of these tulips. And she said to me, she says, would you mind looking through my viewfinder and telling me what you think of the shot that I just framed up? And so basically what I saw in her viewfinder was just a tulip in the top third of the frame with a stem under it. And I, and I told her, I says, Susan, I says, how many times have you seen a tulip framed 
and your composition, just like you've composed this. How many times have you seen that? She goes, well, I've seen it done before like that a lot. Yeah, I says, yeah. I says, you probably already have a tulip at home on your hard drive that's composed exactly like you composed this one. And she goes, yeah, I do. I said, so you've already accomplished that. Why are you going to repeat it over and over again? Uh, I'm not going to shoot a tulip in the top third of the frame with a stem under it because I've got that shot at home. And so I don't need to repeat it. And I'm not going to impress anybody showing this image to, to anybody because again, it's so basic and so overdone as far as the composition goes. So I'm looking for something that's a little different, a little unique, so it stands out and it's something that people haven't seen before. So I'm looking through this little patch of tulips and I'm studying them all. And I says, you know, I frame up a, a tulip that I find interesting. And I says, now look at, look through my viewfinder and tell me if you've ever seen anything that looks like this before. And that's what she saw right there. And so now you've got this tulip that's encased in this green sheathing thing here, like this little sheathing. And then you've got a couple petals that are going opposite directions down below, kind of framing that bottom part. Um, so that's a, that's a picture of a tulip like I've never seen before. And that's what I'm trying to accomplish when I go out to shoot. I don't want to shoot the same thing that everybody else is shooting. Just like when I was in Yosemite, I got really kind of disturbed when I saw what was going on there with people shooting the exact same scenes that goes on 365 days there. So um, I found this and I like this and I think it's something unique and it's something different. Uh, I also found another one, another one that the bud was still kind of more in the budding stage. And again, it's kind of growing out of that little cup there of green. Um, and so uh, again, Little, little different subject, looks a little different than what you typically see. Uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, something that you should be doing when you go out to shoot is trying to find unique subject matter and things that people haven't seen before, uh, interesting things, and then uh, get away from that standard shot of a tulip. Now, I'm not telling you that you should not have a tulip in the top third with a stem under it in your portfolio of images of tulip images, but don't repeat it 20 times or 10 times or even five times. Just have one good shot of a tulip in the top there with a stem under it and then move on and do other compositions of that tulip. Here's another one I did in that same area. I got three shots out of that little patch of tulips. And what I did was I focused up on this top part right up in here. And then I did a soft focus, you know, purposely wanted it to blur out into the bottom there. So like I talked about last week about soft focus flower photography, that's kind of what I did here. Just use a real small f-stop number just to get this little bit in focus up here. And then you get all this softness going down into the hole down here where the stem's coming out. All right, so finding character in nature. This is another thing I teach in my workshops and stuff. And it's, it's um, it, it really, again, is just looking for those unique characters that are out there and so i always you know say well what you know what is character in nature well it's kind of like uh you know you may know someone in you know it's a friend of yours or a family member or co-worker that's a little bit odd a little bit different you know and those people are are, are uh, unusual and we call those people characters you'll say oh uncle joe he's a character because he acts a little strange or he's a little different um and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find those characters that are out in nature, you know, ones that set themselves apart from all the others in their species and are different. So is it easy to find? Um, well, they're not always easy to find and you're, you know, you have to be out there searching a lot, but you have to at least have the mindset to be looking for these characters. And where do you find them? Well, you find them in the woods and the fields. And I find them at the flower departments, you know, at the Meyer store near my home. So uh, they are everywhere, but we have to always be searching for them. So this is a black eyed Susan flower, nothing special. It's, it's just a, um, you know, just a, a snapshot of this flower. It's nothing artistic here. I'm just showing what the flower looks like. And you can see they have a, a dark center with some texture in there and it has evenly spaced petals all the way around the outside. Okay, and that's what 99% of these flowers look like when you find them out in the fields growing. So again, that's your standard shot, but I don't want the standard shot of a, of a black eyed Susan. And I, and I have a few of those, but again, when I go out to shoot them now, I'm not shooting the standard 
basic shots because I've got those. I, I want to find something a little different or unique. So this one morning I'm out shooting and you can see right here, this flower here caught my eye because it had two of the petals that were drooping and going across the top of the flower, going the opposite direction of all the other petals. So again, that makes it unique from all the other flowers. So I get in there and set up, get ready and shoot. And that's a little shot of that where you get the petal kind of just drooping up and going down and over. And there's a little dew drop right on the end over here. So again, a little different shot than just a standard shot of a black eyed Susan because of the shape of the petals, the way they go. And then if you look at this down below, there's another petal here that wraps itself around this petal right here. So it's a very unique black eyed Susan. Uh, and then you want to do different compositions. So I shot a little wider shot and then I got in a little closer so you could see the little petal here and, and the little petal that droops over top of the center here. So again, it's, it's got that character that I'm looking for. It's a different flower than all the other Black Eyed Susans, again, that look like the original where it had this, this dark center with the petals evenly spaced all the way around. Purple cone flowers, there's a huge field uh, not far from my home at one of the parks has all kinds of these beautiful purple cone flowers growing. And again, looking for that unique flower that's different. This is what 99% of them look like. It's just a textured center with petals drooping down all the way around it, right? And again, you're going to go through these big, large fields, and they're all pretty much going to look like that. And I have, again, uh, you know, my basic shot of that, you know, that flower in the top third of the frame with a stem under it, but that's not what I'm looking for when I go out to shoot now. So one morning I'm out there working through the field, uh, looking for some characters, and I come across this guy right here. This is amazing how this seed head, right on the right side, this seed head grew up right next to the cone flower. And then one of the petals here, you can see kind of reaches out and gives it a hug, just kind of hugs that seed right there. And then look at the artistic flow of the petals down below. They're not just drooping straight down towards the ground like all the other ones. There's this unique flow that's happening within those petals, all different directions you can see here. I get a bonus, I get a little bug on the petal. I mean, how lucky is that? Find this cool subject and then have a bug on it at the same time. So if I wouldn't have searched through that field that morning and, and worked that field, I would never have found this subject. And of course that's long gone now, um, but I knew better than to stop at the edge of the field where the flowers start and start shooting. It was, let's walk through this field and look for that unique one. Uh, this is another one that I found. Uh, and this is a different time I was in that field. And what, uh, what I found interesting was this vine that grew right up around the stem of that flower and then right straight up through the top portion up in here. So that's interesting how that's, that uh, vine had grew up around the stem of the flower and right through the top. And the flower itself is a nice looking flower. Um, you know, I posted this online one time and someone said, Oh, this would have been a lot better if you didn't have that vine in there. I'm thinking that's what makes it unique is the vine. <laughs> Otherwise, what would we have? A flower shot with the flower in the top third of the frame and a stem under it, the most basic flower shot you could possibly do. But with that vine growing through there, that makes it unique from the other 99.9% .9 of the flowers in that field. So that's what I'm looking for. Now, this is another one, two-headed Gerber daisy. You know, they're like Siamese twins. They're joined at the stems and they have two heads. Now, when I was doing critiques earlier, I'd mentioned about cutting into the flower and cutting off a lot of those petals. And as you can see, I've framed this up pretty tight. I've cut away a lot of those petals. Now, the reason why I did that is because if I was to include the petals that come way out here, and then these petals would come somewhere way out here, if I included all the petals, I would have a huge gap of nothing down here and a big, big gap all the way around the flower. Now I'm looking at this and saying, you know, this is the most interesting part right in here. All right, so I wanna fill the frame with the most interesting part. And that's again, why I cropped it so tight rather than expand it out and capture the whole thing and add a lot more space around my flowers. I'm at the Meyer store now Meyer's, you know, those of you that might have lived in the Midwest at one time, 
uh, know of the Meyer chain, uh, it's like a Walmart. It's just a gigantic store with everything under the sun for sale in their groceries, everything. And they also have a flower department. And so I go there and I just pass through once in a while whenever I'm in this store, look at the flowers. And they had tulips that came in, potted tulips. And you can see here, uh, you know, there was probably 45, 50 of these potted tulips on the floor. And I'm going through one after another, looking at them. Now, again, 99.9% .9 of them, the tulip looks like this right here. That's kind of a standard looking tulip. But on this one here, look at this guy. One of the petals droops down and there's a green leaf perfectly aligned to catch it as it's falling. And I thought, how cool is that? That is unique. That's different. That, that looks totally different than any other tulip I've ever seen. All right, so take it home, set it up in my house, photograph it, and there it is. That's exactly the way that tulip sat right in that pot. I did not do anything to it, just brought it home, set it up, put a green background behind it in the house and photographed it. And it's just so cool how this one petal, and you know, what are the chances on, on this tulip that that one petal droops down and there's a green leaf perfectly aligned to catch it as it's falling? I think that's just amazing. So, hey Mike, you, the, yeah. um, the lighting looks kind of um, very interesting on here. How do you set up the lighting? Okay, so this looks like kind of a spotlight on there, right? right in here. And that's done in uh, Nick software. They have a, uh, in Color Effects Pro 4, there's a filter in there called Darken Lighten Center. And what it, what it is, is you can put a spotlight in your image anywhere you want. You can move the spotlight wherever you want. You can change the size of the spotlight. You can change the intensity of the spotlight. Um, so that's what I applied. I just applied this little spotlight right in here, just to give it a little different look. So this is a, uh, um, cool subject that I found. Uh, what I liked about this one is the green leaf that grew right in between these two petals right there. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Well, that flower was there and one of the leaves just kind of grew right between there. And then you had the little water drops on there. Water drops always add a nice little effect on top of your flowers. Now, another thing is, you know, when flowers are dying, they go through this artistic phase where they start to curl up into all kinds of different positions and stuff as they die. And so, you know, I might buy flowers and bring them home and I'll shoot them while they're in nice pristine condition, but then I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, wait to see how they're going to react as they go through the dying stages. And so this one was a Gerber daisy that uh, curled, these little things curled like this, and it just looks really cool how they curled up like that. And then these here are starting to curl, so they haven't got there yet, but uh, again, just a really cool, interesting little formation. So again, most people you see shooting Gerber daisies, well, you get to see the standard Gerber daisy with the center and the petals all the way around it, and they all look the same. This one looks totally different. It has that character that I'm talking about uh, because of the uniqueness in the petals, the way they formed. And you remember that uh, flower I showed you a few slides back that I bought at the Meyer store? Well, this is the same flower. Now look what's happened to it. It's starting to die. And look at how the petals are curling up. And you can see this one petal. That's the one that got caught in that green leaf there. It's still caught in the green leaf. But now it's drooping down because it's starting to die. So again, totally different than what it looked like before. Uh, and you can shoot all different compositions of these. Now, I always tell people too, I says, you know, if you find something that has some really interesting character, it's really different. Don't just shoot one composition, shoot four or five different angles and different ways to shoot it. I shot this flower as a vertical and a horizontal, and I shot it from, you know, backs and front and all over. Because again, that flower is in a, you know, somewhere in a, 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 a junkyard or a dump, uh, rotted away. Uh, I can't reshoot it. So while you have it in your possession, or, you know, if you're at a park shooting something, you want to make sure that, uh, that uh, when you find something really unique, that you shoot a lot of different compositions, and you're going to find that you'll have one that you really like. But, uh, you know, this is something that someday I'll, you know, post it out there and show people and because it's just a different look from the original that I had. All right, so this is something that uh, I, I um, do on a uh, Facebook group. It's it's a group uh, uh, called Let's See Your Best Shot. And 
every week we have a different theme. I actually have a couple ladies that um, that kind of run the run the thing now, and they they change the theme every Wednesday. I think it gets changed, uh, and there's something like six thousand members on there, and, and it's amazing all the images that get posted with all the different themes. But uh, this particular week, the theme, as you can see at the top there, was called Morning Dew. Morning Dew is the name of that theme for that week. Now, when you post an image in this group, um, typically most people don't get very many likes. Uh, you know, it just seems like the participation of people hitting the like button is not all that great sometimes. And so you'll get maybe 20 likes, 30 likes, if it's a decent image. And if it's really, really good, you might get up to 100 likes. That would be a really good a day if you hit 100 likes on one of your images. Well, this image right here, uh, Mike, I don't even want to pronounce that last name without butchering it, but uh, he got a, 305 likes on this image. Now that is a lot of likes and, and, and because it's a really cool image. Now these teasels, this is a teasel. I shoot these all the time up here in Michigan, but I have never ever seen one that had a spider web in the center of it like that. So I thought that is really cool, man. This guy found a really cool subject. And that's what I was talking about, you know, unique subject matter, character. Um, now, I don't, I would say that he didn't crop very well because, again, he shot it, he shot a tall subject as a horizontal. And look at all the space here and the space over here. It doesn't need that. Should have shot it as a vertical and eliminated all the space or cropped it in. Would have been a stronger image if it was cropped. Now, uh, the thing is, is that it's such a cool subject matter that people just kind of, ignored the fact that it wasn't composed, you know, in the right frame uh, and still got 305 likes. Now look at this next image. That is really cool. That's a nice doe licking her nose and she's, this looks like she's in cotton candy. And so I, I've never ever seen anything like that before. And that is just a really unique image. And now Michael Leary got 353 likes on that image. That's even better than the last one, right? Because it's just a really cool image and people saw that and they were they were able, you know, were willing to go in there and hit that like button. And, and he got a lot of comments and stuff because they really liked that image. Now let's look at the next one here. Joan Balin, she entered this really nice dewy covered rose and she did a beautiful job on it. It's a really nice rose shot. Now. Compared to the others that got over 300 likes, Joan got 96 likes on her image. And that's still pretty good. I mean, that's still much, much higher rate of likes than most of the image get that gets posted. Now let's look at this one here. Casey, um, nice spider web shot. Really nice dewy covered spider web. Look at this, it's got letters in there. It's got a V, it's got an I, it's got a Y, it's got a W. And so it's kind of cool. You know, it's got some lettering in there. And so he's got a really nice image of a spider web. Do we cover spider web? But look at the likes on this one. Only 32 likes on that one. So why is it that uh, these last two images didn't get the amount of likes that the first two? Well, here's the thing is that most people that are, you know, looking at macro images, you know, if you're looking at enough, enough websites and enough uh, groups on Facebook, you're going to see a lot of dewy covered spider webs. So a lot of people see an image like this and they go, well, that's nice, but I've seen it many, many times before. And so it's, you know, there's nothing I haven't seen before. So I'm impressed, but not that impressed. The same with this last one. Let's go to that last one, previous. Now, again, Joan's got a beautiful shot of this rose here, but how many rose images have you seen? Billions. There's billions of rose images out there. So again, a subject that's very nice, but nothing we haven't seen before so many times already. So again, did pretty good on the likes, 96. But um, again, it's just not, it's not anything unusual. Now, if we go to the last one, this one, now that's something that you've never seen before, and you probably will never see it again. So that makes that image a very, very unique image. That's why I got 353 likes. The same way with this little, little spider web on the teasel. 
Again, I've shot these things for 20 years, never ever seen a spider web in the top of one of those teasels. So again, very unique shot, never seen it before, probably never will see it again. So he has a once in a lifetime shot, just like that dough in that, that what looked like cotton candy. Um, that's what you're looking for when you go out to shoot. That's what you're going to, you know, produce that's going to make your images stand out from everybody else's. And I'm assuming you spend the day to come here and listen to this. Uh, that's what's going to make your images stand out, finding unique subject matter that nobody's seen before. It's so different that, you know, it's a one in a lifetime type shot. But you're not going to find them if you're not out there shooting a lot. <laughs> you know, you can't go out <laughs> once a month and expect to find all these great subjects. It, it's not going to happen. You have to spend a lot of time out in the field shooting. Now, luckily for 15 years, been doing this full time. So I can spend a lot of time out shooting. So I tend to find probably more images of unique subject matter than other people do because they don't spend as much time out there. And I also have four parks within 20 minutes of my home that gives me huge amounts of opportunity to find cool stuff. So, but that's what it takes to produce images. And I'm, I'm assuming that you all want to produce good quality images and, and be able to show everybody cool images like that dough or that little spider that uh, little spider web in the teasel. Uh, and again, these images that here, like this one here and the last one of the rows are also very good images. But again, because we've seen those images so many times before, same subject matter, uh, it's not as impressive when we see something like that. So that's what you want to do is search out those unique subject matter. Okay, so that's, that's just all I wanted to show you for today. Um, I was going to mention, um, yeah. Joan Balin is a member of our photo club. Yeah, I she ran into won Joan. The photo, she's won the photo of the year for the last two years <laughs> in well, our club. Joan's so she's getting good. better picking subjects. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was at um, a conference and I showed those four images. And, uh, and I don't remember where I was at when I did that conference, but she was in the audience when oh, I showed cool. it. Um, also that Casey, uh, the spider web guy, he was in an audience and uh, uh, I was doing the uh, nature photographers, uh, North Carolina CNPA conference and he was in the he was in the audience when I showed the his image up on the screen there. Um, and, and the funny thing was Joan was a little upset because she felt that like I was knocking her image saying well she didn't get as many okay. likes as the other ones. Uh, but then people explained to her, well, people were coming up to her after the program and they, they were telling her, you go, Joan, that was an amazing image you shot. That was beautiful. She says, yeah, but he was saying that it wasn't that good. And I never said it wasn't good. Just like I told you guys, <laughs> I said that it was an excellent shot of a rose. It's just that it's been done so many times like that, that people aren't as impressed with that kind of shot as they are with that do in the cotton wood or in the cotton candy or the uh, spider in the top of a teasel. Uh, those are images of subject matter that people have never seen before. That's why it got 300 and some likes. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, you can shoot, a, a, you know, roses till you're blue in the face, but you're never going to, uh, you know, you, people will like it. But again, you won't get that kind of response that they got to the dough and the cut and then the cotton candy or the uh, spider web in the top of the teasel because they're just, you know, you want to you look at some of that, you go, that is something that is only a once in a lifetime type thing. It just doesn't happen very often. Um, so that's, it's a real simple concept. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, getting back to that Yosemite thing with Ansel Adams, well, Ansel made all those images, the originals, you know, he was the one that would, would shot those and, and created those images that everybody else wants to shoot. Um, so he's the originator of it. And so he's famous for it, right? Uh, but everybody else that shoots it now, you're not going to get famous shooting those same images. It's already been done. It's been done to death. Um, so if, if all you're going to do is just repeat what everybody else is doing, then you're just going to fall into that trap and your image is going to look like everybody else's images. So uh, if you really want to stand out, you want to uh, have images that are going to win your contest and like that, you got to search out unique subject matter. And that's not to say that they're going to be tons and tons of these unique sub subject matter. There, there's not. But you have to at least be thinking that those thoughts when you go out into the fields and the woods and the, and the flower departments, you got to be looking and searching for something that's different, and unique. Uh, and if you have that mindset, you've got a greater chance of finding it than if you're just going out there and just randomly picking out the first flower you come across. So 
All right, well, that's about all I had to say for today. And if you want to learn more about this, like I say, you can join my Macro Photo Club. There's a 230 some videos that I produce that teach you all this stuff. So, okay, Tom. Well, Mike, I want to thank you so much for what you've done uh, today. Oh, it was really fantastic. It's uh, my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I've really enjoyed your uh, club and I encourage others if you really want to get more out of your macro photography to get involved. Uh, I haven't submitted any images yet, but when you talked about a couple of those last ones, they were so unique. I have a couple that I think might be worth throwing in there yeah. to have you look at. <clears throat> and but, that, that's really the key to, uh, you know, getting, getting yourself in that point where you're coming up with you know, good quality images that people are going to view and, yeah. and, and, you know, really give you a lot of pats on the back and likes for what you've accomplished. And, and we all want that. I mean, I don't want to produce images that I put out there and people just kind of like, eh, doesn't yeah. do anything for me. I want to put images out there. That people go, wow, that's really cool. Uh, I think we all want to do that. So, um, but again, it's just, it's in, you know, when I go out to shoot, that's my mindset. I'm not going out there to shoot the standard uh, subject matter. Uh, I'm going out there, you know, if, again, if it's, if it's roses and I want to find something unique in that rose, or if it's the, you know, the, the black eyed Susans, I want to find something that's different, unique about that black eyed Susan or the purple cone flowers. Like I showed you, uh, I don't want the standard ones. And I do have those shots. I, I do photograph those when I first start shooting that particular flower. But once I've accomplished that, I don't need to repeat it over and over. I'll see people that will will post, you know, the same flower in the same composition, you know, 10 different times. And, and it may be a different flower, but it's the composition is exactly the same on every one of them. You haven't done anything, you know, creative at all. So, and yeah. then again, that's just a simple concept. Yeah. What I put up there. Yeah, that uh, looks cool. Everyone is kind of my setup, what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't have my good, uh, uh, mirrorless camera back from repair yet in fact i just got it back today from canon they, uh, it was really a, about a one week turnaround i couldn't update the firmware uh -huh. so that was my little m50 mirrorless which uh -huh. is a crop sensor camera and i i felt uh, i would just that was the only thing i was stuck with to put my images together yeah but but, uh, but your images come out nice though i mean as yeah. far as you know sharpness and all that they look good yeah yeah, so, and, uh, and when I anyway. when I was talking about all those images about sharpening them all, um, they don't come out of the camera tack sharp. You know what I mean? No, I mean I, no. I've never had an image come out of my camera that was tack sharp right out of the camera that didn't require some kind of sharpening, and yeah, that's what those sharpening Lightroom. programs are for. Yeah, yeah, I use Lightroom and Photoshop, and I got Topaz, mm -hmm. and I have On One and uh, Nix. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, you can get so engrossed in doing all the post-processing of your images, you can almost go crazy because <laughs> sometimes yeah. you forget about the one that looked good and you got to go back about 10 steps to go back to the one you you thought was a good uh, selection. Yeah, but, and, and that's what I, I mentioned about Ansel Adams, about how people always talk about how great he was in the dark room, you know, his burning and dodging and, and yeah. all the how he yeah. created such amazing looks in his images with that. And that's kind of what we're doing today. We're, we're doing yeah. the same thing. But uh, I, I, when I first started in photography, I, I was doing, you know, simple post-processing just, and it was just a matter of it had to be done because they didn't come out of the camera looking all that great. So I was doing it out of necessity, but, and I found it kind of boring. I thought, well, this is a waste of time, but you got to do it. But now I've found so many more things I can do creatively when the post-processing that now I actually like the post-processing as much as I do is actually making the image. And uh, wow. yeah, so uh, cool. it's something that evolved, I, you know, with me, it evolved into, uh, uh, you know, where I really, really enjoy doing the post-processing now. Yeah. But right. when you have a program like Smart Photo Editor, it gives you 7,000 creative filters. <laughs> yeah. It, it kind of makes you go crazy, too. <laughs> well, 29 bucks, you'd be pretty yeah. hard to go wrong on that. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, everybody, uh, I am going to give everybody a link today. Now, you might want to see it or you might not want to, but I did a 10-minute flight from Stewart up to Vero Beach on X plane and it's just, I use the same plane I used to fly. 
and it's a video and I'll be sending a link out to everybody that attended today. Just kind of a little bonus. If you want to watch it, you can. Uh, I just thought it would be a little add on to uh, sticking with us for the time you spent with us today. So uh, other than that, I'm going to end the meeting here. All right. And uh, I, I thought it went very well. Well, thanks a lot. Mike, it was very informative. Thanks. It was fun. Fun time. Thanks Thank for you, Mike. Me. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I guess I'm going to go out and uh, walk in the in the cold. And I'll send everybody <laughs> a record. I'll send everybody a recording. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Lal. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.